start to stir. What you need to end up with is a caramel that looks a dark amber colour or say one shade darker than runny honey. And that's why you need to have a pale saucepan. If you, if you make it in a black saucepan, it's very hard to see the colour. And um, one other thing I, I didn't mention before is when you're making caramel, it is important. This is the only occasion when I would use white to cast a sugar and not golden, because if you start off with golden, you know, it's quite, it's quite difficult to judge it. So that's just about ready now. What we need to do to finish the caramel is turn the heat out and then we're going to add two tablespoons of warm water. Now when you add the warm water there's usually a bit of a splutter so you need to stand well back and perhaps hold the jug with, your, with a cloth. So we'll put that in now. It is a bit of a frightening thing to see actually because it does sort of bubble and go sticky and toffee-like, but that is exactly how it should be. Just give it a good, good whisk. And then when all the bubbles subside, take it over to the caramel dish. And the dish I'm using is in fact a souffle dish. And put two-thirds of the caramel into the souffle dish. And then the rest stays in the saucepan, and we'll just get rid of that. And then what you do is you take the dish and you pour the caramel round the edge so that it's coating the base of the dish and the edge of the dish. And that's going to be the topping when we turn the creme caramel out. Now we go back to the saucepan and turn the heat on again, this time on to low. And I'm going to add the first ingredients for making the caramel custard and that is half a pint of single cream and a quarter of a pint of full cream milk. And that goes onto the caramel that's left in the saucepan. And then I'm going to take my whisk <coughs> and whisk it over quite a gentle heat so all the caramel that's left there will actually get melted and mixed into the custard. And that means you shouldn't have much left on your saucepan. Now what can happen when you're trying to reincorporate the caramel is it can go hard and sort of cling to your whisk like this and it can cling to the base of the saucepan as well but not to worry because the heat will eventually melt it so not to worry and then I sometimes get letters from people saying how do you clean caramel off the base of a saucepan well the way to do that is to actually put the saucepan back on the heat with some hot water and bring it up to the boil and it'll melt you won't have any problem if you put it in cold water you'll be in trouble now the next bit of the recipe is we're going to take the caramel uh, mixture over to a jug here that's containing four beaten eggs. So that's going to go to join the eggs now. And we have got a little bit of caramel stuck on the saucepan there. So that'll, that'll come off easily later. Give that a little whisk now and add one more ingredient which is a teaspoonful of vanilla extract. Another good whisk. Now that's going to go into the dish containing the caramel, but we're going to just strain it through a sieve just in case there are any little clumps of caramel left. I don't think there are, but it's just a wise precaution. And I didn't tell you the size of the souffle dish, which is in fact one and a half pints. Now we're going to put that into a roasting tin, and I'm going to just fill the roasting tin with some water about an inch of water and the water should be just off the boil and that goes into a preheated oven quite a low uh, heated oven gas mark 2 or the equivalent and it's going to take an hour and a quarter to just very very gently cook This is our finished creme caramel. When it comes out of the oven, you need to just test whether it's cooked by just putting your little finger in the centre here. Uh, it's like cooking a quiche. If it sort of feels set, then it's all right. After an hour and a quarter, then remove it from the oven. As soon as it's absolutely cold, cover it with cling film and then chill it in the refrigerator. And I think it's nicer if it's made the day before and, and left to really chill overnight. Then turn it out just before serving. And to do that, you take a small palette knife and slide it around, all the way around the edge. And what I haven't told you, 
so far is how many this is going to serve. And I think it serves four to six people. So make sure it's nice and loose at the edges. Just push it in with your fingers as well a bit. Then put a plate on top like that and turn it upside down. Bit of manoeuvring here. Then you need to give it a good hefty a shake. And you can hear it come out. And there we go. The caramel's beginning to seep out of the edge here. And there it is. And all that lovely caramel we put in, in the bottom there has all come around on the top and turned into this beautiful sauce. If you prefer coffee to toffee, you might like to make this dessert, which begins by soaking powdered gelatin in water. Then the gelatin is added to a custard of egg yolks and whole milk, stabilized with corn flour. And to the hot custard, you add six heaped teaspoons of espresso coffee powder. When that's completely dissolved, pour the mixture into a mixing bowl, and when it's cool, whisk in seven fluid ounces of creme fraiche. Then in another bowl, whisk up the whites of the eggs to the soft peak stage, then gently fold them into the mixture. Then pour it into glass cups or moulds and set it aside for two hours. Then chill thoroughly before serving, and when you serve it, pour in a coffee syrup made with sugar and espresso powder, and top with softly whipped double cream. Well, now we're going to look at two more wonderful dairy ingredients. The first one is buttermilk, and the second one is clotted cream. And if you've got some buttermilk and some clotted cream, there's only one thing in the world you can make, and that is buttermilk scones and serve them with the clotted cream. Well, buttermilk is now quite widely available and it's excellent. We used it in part one for making those lovely pancakes, but it's very good for baking, for making scones and cakes and all sorts of things. So today I'm going to show you buttermilk scones. And I started off with eight ounces of self-raising flour and three ounces of butter. Now, one thing I have to tell you, don't make the mistake I have made I'm ashamed to say a couple of times in my life and that is look at the bag of flour it must be self-raising because if you're in a hurry and you make a mistake and you use plain flour you won't have very good scones and I've done it myself so I'm warning you so it's self-raising flour eight ounces and three ounces of butter and that's been rubbed together until it gets to the crumbly stage like this and the flour was sifted and now I'm going to add one and a half ounces of golden caster sugar the unrefined caster sugar I'm just going to mix that in to the rest. And then in my jug, I've got two tablespoons of buttermilk, and that's been beaten with one large egg. And that's going to go in. I made a little well in the center there. Start off mixing with a palette knife. And then when you can't mix any more with a knife, then you go in with your hands. And you might find you need a spot more buttermilk, but we'll see how we go now. And if it feels too dry, which I think this is probably going to, but you've got to have a little bit of patience and just work it round because it does sometimes go right in. No, I do think we're going to have to have a spot more. So I've got a spot more here in my jug. And I'll just add maybe like a teaspoonful, something like that. And then the secret of making scones, good scones, providing you've got the self-raising flour, is to roll them out properly. It's the rolling out that actually determines how good your scones are. So work it round until all the crummy bits, like when we made pastry, are incorporated. And then you get rid of the bowl and you flour your work surface lightly and then just shape the dough into a round Take a rolling pin, give that a little bit of a flowering as well, and then lightly, very lightly, one hand on each end of the rolling pin, roll it out, and what you want is a dough that's one inch thick. And that is the secret of scone making. So the thing to do is to get a tape measure and just measure an inch. 
Then you take a cutter, this is two inches in diameter, put it lightly on the dough and then give it a sharp tap and you've got your first scone which will come out quite easily like that and you go on around until you've used all that and then you re-roll the trimmings and you start again. I'll do one more. Don't twist the cutter because otherwise you'll get a funny shape. Just lightly on top, out it comes and you can see it's an inch high. Then brush them with a little bit of milk and then just sprinkle them with more flour and pop them into a very hot oven preheated to 425 degrees and they'll take 12 minutes to cook. Well here we are, these have cooled a little bit but I think it's quite nice to eat them just slightly warm. In any case you don't want to eat them the next day, they need to be eaten nice and fresh but I don't think you'll have any problems. But what I want to do is split the scone in half and just show you how lovely and light and feathery that is in the middle. And then what we're going to do now is just give it, first of all, some wonderful clotted cream, which was just invented to go on scones. It's so beautiful. And then this is another recipe that I've prepared. This one is called raspberry butter. And it's a raspberry puree that's been sieved and then cooked with sugar until it becomes thick like this. And it's like a beautiful sort of fresh tasting preserve. So there we are clotted cream scones with raspberry butter. This is one of the great classic English desserts. Eaton Mess is what it's called and it's the strawberry and cream dessert traditionally served at Eton College. It's brilliant for nervous meringue makers because never mind the cracks you're going to break them up and serve them with the strawberries and double cream and a puree. These are pecan shortbreads and they're filled with a mixture of ready-made custard mixed with creme fraiche. After that, add some fresh raspberries and some raspberry coulis, then top with another shortbread, a few more raspberries and dust with icing sugar. Well, that's just a glimpse into the enormous subject of dairy foods, but I'll be coming back and next time I'm going to share with you some recipes with fruits. This time we have a traditional apple crumble, a curry from Thailand and my own version of the famous classic American key lime pie. Hello and welcome to a programme which today is all about fruits and we're going to kick off by me showing you the best fruit salad I've ever made. But before I do that, uh, we're going to prepare some fruits. I want to show you how to prepare fruits. But I thought this would be a good opportunity in how to cook to just have a little word before we start cutting up fruits about knives. And really, over the years I've been cooking, I've sort of confined myself down to having only six knives in my kitchen now that seem to serve every purpose um, that I need. 
First one is this one here, which is a pallet knife. But it's got a serrated edge, so you can use it as a pallet knife, but you can also use it um, to cut bread. It's actually very, very good for carving, very good for carving as well, and because it's a pallet knife, it's very good for spreading. This is very important. This is a vegetable pairer, and we spoke about that when we did, when we did the vegetable programme. This is quite a good little knife too. This is a curved paring knife, which I seem to use that quite a lot. That's very good also for getting into awkward corners of things. This used to be called a tomato knife, but it isn't now, but it does slice tomatoes very, very well. It's got a serrated edge, and I use it for many, many other uses. This is a kitchen knife that's used for everything under the sun, for, for chopping, for cutting, also for filleting fish. I don't believe in having a special knife, I just use that for everything. And then this is also a general little kitchen knife. This one's got a serrated edge. But what about getting sharpness? Well, let's have a look at how to sharpen knives. This is a rather nice modern sharpening steel. You hold it in a horizontal position, so it's facing you like this, in a horizontal position. Then you take your knife, and I learned to do this from, from a friend of mine who's a butcher. He taught me how to do this, and the way he explained it years and years ago was you always start with the heel of the knife, so that's this bit here, and you just go down one side and then down the other side, but always starting at the heel of the knife, and then, you know, you get more and more quick. And he said to me, the best way to sharpen knives, we'll just do a, a small one as well, the best way to sharpen knives is little and often. So you don't, you know, spend a long time. You just little, use your knife, then a little bit more and a little bit more. So there we are. I hope you found that helpful. And now I'm going to show you the recipe, which is for a tropical fruit salad in Planter's Punch. And if you visit the Caribbean, which I have several times, um, they make a drink called Planter's Punch. And what I've done is more or less made the same mixture, but used it as a syrup to make um, the fruit salad. But preparing fruit. First one I thought I'd show you, this is in the, in the recipe, this is fresh pineapple, is how to deal with the pineapple, because it can be quite forbidding. It's sort of not a very friendly looking thing, is it? But when you're choosing a pineapple, you need to remember that the colour doesn't indicate the ripeness because sometimes it can be fully ripe but it's still quite green. Some pineapples are green, some are amber in colour. One of the indications you can look for is these little points here. If they're brown and shriveled, that's a good example, like that. Also, if you turn the pineapple upside down and you press it with your thumbs here, if it gives and it feels quite soft, that's another indication. Then there's one more indication. The, the leaves at the top here, if you take a leaf and you give a sharp tug and it comes away easily like that, that's an indication. And um, finally, the final thing you need to do is have a little sniff, because if it's ripe, you'll definitely get that lovely sort of pineapple aroma. So then what do we do with it? First of all, take the, the, the leaf end off like that with your sharpened knife. Then take the other end off like that. Then stand it up on its end and go down as close as you can to the flesh. And when you've gone all the way round, you'll find that you've got these little brown marks here. Let's get rid of the debris. And what you do with these is you just take the point of a vegetable pear or potato peeler and you just pull it out like that. You go round it like that and pull those out. Then you cut it into quarters, lengthways, and you end up with quarters looking like this. And all you need to then do is just cut the core out. This, this, this core part in the middle here isn't really edible, so that comes away. And then it's all ready to cut into nice chunks. And that's how we want it for the fruit salad. But let's run through the other fruits. First of all, mango. I'm not going to show you how to prepare a mango now. We're going to do that later on in the programme. Next one is passion fruit. And if you're puzzled about what to do with passion fruit, the first thing to do is to look for a really wrinkled skin. There's one here that's not so wrinkled. It's quite smooth, so that wouldn't, wouldn't really be ready. But this one's nice and wrinkled. So the way to prepare that is simply cut it in half 
and then you'll see all the juice and the seeds inside and all you do with those is you take a teaspoon and just slide those lovely seeds and juice out and you eat the seeds and the juice and they have a wonderful fragrance and flavour. This one's kiwi fruit and all that needs is peeling and slicing. These are lychees served in Chinese restaurants a lot, used in Chinese cooking. And all you do with these is you just take the skin off and peel it. It comes off quite easily. And when the skin is off, you slice it in half, going all the way around like that. And inside, you're going to find a big sort of brown pip. And the brown pip needs to come out so that you're left with two halves of the flesh. And that is juicy and delicious and lovely. Now we've got this one. This is called pawpaw or papaya. The way to tell if this is ready is give it a squeeze like an avocado and if it gives you some give. But also it should be yellow. It should be turning yellow like this one here. If it's all green, it's not going to be ready. And this is a wonderful fruit because as soon as you open it out, it has the most incredibly wonderful colour, sort of deep peachy apricot. All you do with that is just take the seeds out, then peel off the skin with a knife, just peel it, um, and chop it into chunks for your fruit salad. Finally, not an exotic fruit, one that we're all very familiar with every day, and that's an orange, but I just thought I might show you how to segment an orange and get rid of all the pith. First of all, the peel comes off more or less the same way as we did with the pineapple. And then that reveals the segment, segments all the way round. And the way to get a neat segment with no pith is to just take your knife in, where you see that line showing you the pith, put your knife in, and then go down the other side, where the next bit of pith is, and then just pull your segment out Take out the middle bit, like that, and that's all ready then for your, for your fruit salad. And the fruit in the fruit salad is two bananas, eight ounces of black grapes halved, a pawpaw, a large mango, a small pineapple, four passion fruit, two oranges, eight ounces of lye cheese, and two kiwi fruit. And what you do is chop it up into nice big chunky chunks. I think one of the things that spoils a fruit salad is that I often see people chopping the fruit too small. I think you've got to have really nice chunky bits like this. And now for the best bit, the planter's punch. In my jug here I've got 10 fluid ounces of water and this has been made into a syrup with four ounces of sugar and I've got the zest of two limes thinly paired off with the potato peeler and that's just been put on a very low heat until the sugar is dissolved. And you can see I've got two cinnamon sticks in there too, so it's just got a vague, faint flavour of cinnamon. So the syrup goes onto the fruit, like that, straining out the peel. And then I've got four fluid ounces of pineapple juice. I've got four fluid ounces of freshly squeezed orange juice. And I've got five fluid ounces of dark rum. Very Caribbean, that one. And the zest of the two limes went in here, and the juice is in here. So the juice of the two limes. Now you need to just give that a really, really good mix to distribute all the flavours. And if you, if you have planter's punch in the Caribbean, what they do, I'll just give it some juice is they just finish it off with a little bit of finely grated nutmeg. That is tropical fruit salad in planter's punch. This is a recipe for an old-fashioned trifle made with rhubarb. The rhubarb is baked in the oven with the juice and zest of an orange and four ounces of golden caster sugar. You begin by halving trifle sponges and spreading both halves with some marmalade. Then put them back together again and cut each one into three little sandwiches. Put them in a bowl and prick them with a skewer before sprinkling over four fluid ounces of Madeira.
When the rhubarb is cooked and cooled, put the chunks into a bowl and mix any of the remaining juices in a jug with orange juice and a dissolved sachet of gelatin. This will make a jelly which is added to the trifle and while it chills and sets in the fridge, whisk together some ready-made custard with Greek yoghurt and then spoon this over the set jelly. Now chill again until you're ready to serve, then just before serving sprinkle the surface with toasted pecan nuts. Well, as promised, I'm now going to show you how to prepare a mango. And the reason I'm going to show you that is because I want to show you a Thai fish curry with mango. I love Thailand, I love Thai recipes, and it's amazing how many of them incorporate the lovely fruits that they have there. Now, how do we deal with a mango? Well, first of all, when you buy a mango, you need to sort of pick it up like we did with the avocado, hold it in your hands, and if it's got give under it, it's ripe. The colour has nothing to do with ripeness. It can be green and ripe, and it can be red and not ripe. So you just need to give it that little bit of pressure. Also, a ripe mango has a nice sort of perfume. You can smell the wonderful perfume. It's an excellent fruit, one of the best of all. And when you get it home and you want to prepare it, it's quite tricky if you don't know how. So I'm going to show you how. It's got a big, long stone in the middle. So you take a sharp knife, slide the knife in and take it one side of the stone on that side and then one side of the stone on that side and then you can see the lovely beautiful colour of the flesh, it's an absolutely gorgeous colour then you take a, a small knife and you make incisions across like that and as if you were doing noughts and crosses you go back again like that and then you turn it sort of inside out like that and what you'll see is you've got little cubes of mango then you take your sharp knife again and just put the cubes of mango into your bowl ready for whatever you're going to do and I'll just show you what to do with the other bit and that is take the skin off like that and then go all the way around with the knife and then you just need to chop the flesh away from the stone. It's not going to be this time, it's not going to be in nice little cubes, it's going to be however you can get it, however you can get hold of it. So you just, there, I've, I've hit the stone there, so what I'm going to do is just keep on going and get all the little bits of mango away from the stone so that what I end up with in the end is just a stone and all the flesh off it. And sometimes if there are little bits clinging to the stone, you can just pick the stone up and eat them off. I often do that. Right, so that's how to prepare a mango. Now we're going to do the first part of the curry. And what I've got over here is a large cooking pot, could be a wok. And that's going to go onto a high heat, which has already been preheated. And then into that, I'm going to put two tins of coconut milk. Good store cupboard ingredient, this one two tins of coconut milk into the hot casserole and first of all you've got to bring it up to the boil still over a high heat we'll give it a stir and then you turn the heat down and let it simmer for about 20 minutes until it's reduced to half its original quantity and what will happen is as it reduces down it will begin to split and go oily and look a bit curdly but that's absolutely normal so you don't have to worry. Well now we're going to make the Thai curry paste but first of all one of the important ingredients is lemongrass and in case you haven't used lemongrass before I just want to tell you how to prepare it and the thing to do is to think spring onions it's just the same as spring onions you take the outer layer away which is, which is tougher take the root off and then take the, the end away which is most of the green bit and then just chop the lemongrass into pieces for this recipe it's, it's all going to go into the processor so you don't have to worry about how you chop it right so we'll put the lemongrass in here first into the food processor two stalks of lemongrass prepared like that then we've got four cloves of garlic they go in 
This is fresh root ginger. I've got about one inch piece and that's been peeled and cut into slices. And then I've got one small onion that's been quartered. Goes in next. And here I've got chilies. Now, I'm using two of these fat, mild chilies that we spoke about earlier on in the series because I want some chilli flavour but I don't want it very hot. But somebody who's working here with me this week said that they like it hot. So if you want it really hot, use these little chilies here. These are called bird's eye chilies. They're the authentic Thai chilies. They're much hotter and you'd need about eight of those to get a really hot curry. So you can choose. But I'm using two and they've just been de-seeded and cut in half. Then we've got the zest of a lime and the juice of the same lime. That goes in next. And then this lovely ingredient that we spoke about in the first program, in the store cupboard program, Thai fish sauce. And here we need three tablespoons. One, two, three. And then finally, another Thai ingredient, this is shrimp paste, and we're going to use a teaspoonful of shrimp paste, which is going to give us the most incredible flavour. And now I'm just going to put the lid on and whisk that up into a puree. Now, I have to say, it doesn't look very promising at this stage, but wait till you taste all those flavours. They're wonderful. Now, the fish we're using is here, and this is two pounds of fresh haddock here, but you could use cod or you could use um, halibut, or you could abandon white fish altogether and just use some big, fat, juicy tiger prawns, you know, whichever, whichever you prefer. Right, and then the coconut milk is now reduced. Now let me just tell you, because I think this is quite important, that all of this can be prepared in advance. The fish, the mango, the curry paste, and even the sauce can all be prepared in advance. And then just before you want to eat the curry, you're going to, it's going to take about five or six minutes to cook. And what you do is, we're going to turn the heat back up a little bit now, in there. And I'm going to first of all add the, the fish. And then I'm going to add the curry paste. Give that a good stir. Give that all a really, really good stir to amalgamate it. And then as soon as it comes back to simmering point, then you just give it four minutes cooking. So the fish has just had four minutes cooking now. I'm going to add my prepared mango, and that's going to have another two minutes. And then finally, just before you serve the curry, sprinkle it with three tablespoons of chopped coriander leaves, and that gives it a lovely colour. And I think this is nice served with Thai fragrant rice, and it'll be enough for four quite hungry people. This is a very unusual recipe for figs, which are roasted, topped with gorgonzola cheese, and then there's a sauce made with honey and red wine vinegar. Simply halve 12 figs and place them on a baking sheet. Season with salt and pepper and grill for five to six minutes until they're soft and toasted. Now take six ounces of gorgonzola picante, cut into cubes, and put the cubes onto the figs. Pop them back under the grill until the cheese is melted and bubbling and faintly golden brown. For the sauce, combine two tablespoons each of runny honey and red wine vinegar before pouring it over the figs. Now I'd like to show you one of the easiest and fastest fruit recipes in the world. It's called oat slices and today I'm going to make them with plums and cinnamon. And I just want to give you a little tip first because I've got a pound of plums here that have been 
uh, stoned and sliced. So how to deal with a plum if you want to stone and slice it is you take a sharp knife and where you see the natural line in the plum, you just slit it open like that. And then if you give it a twist, it will come completely in half and then you can just ease the rest of the stone out with your fingers. And then cut it in slices, a pound of plums cut in slices and to that I'm going to add a rounded teaspoon of cinnamon powder. Seems quite a lot, but it actually is very, very good. And just mix it into the plums. And then in my mixing bowl here, I've got, well, I'm going to put in 10 ounces of organic whole wheat flour. And then five ounces of porridge oats. And these are also organic porridge oats. And then I'm just going to mix those together and add a teaspoon of salt. Seems quite a lot of salt, a teaspoonful, but it does make a difference. So in goes the salt. And now I'm going to mix that with a mixture I've got prepared in my saucepan here. And this is eight ounces of melted butter. And the butter has been melted with four ounces of light, soft brown sugar. So I'll just give that a stir because it's separated out a bit whilst it's been waiting for me. <coughs> Pour that into the centre. And then I'm going to start mixing with my spoon just to get that all mixed together. And then I shall finish off in the end with my hands. I'm afraid I'm a bit of a, a, a hands-on person. I really always think that hands are really better and quicker in the end. So we'll just get that finally mixed. Now, the nice thing about this recipe is that you can make it with any fruit at all. Today I've got plums, but it's wonderful with apricots, peaches. It's very nice with uh, prunes. It's also very, very good. I've done it in another recipe collection with mincemeat. So if you've got any mincemeat left over from Christmas, that also makes a nice filling. Now, take half that mixture and put it into a baking tin. And this baking tin actually measures 10 inches by 6 inches by 1 inch. But for once, I'm going to tell you that it's not vital. You could have a tin, not any smaller, but certainly you could have one that's just slightly bigger. Then just press it with your hands. So you can see how easy this is. It's absolutely stunningly delicious, but at the same time, it's terribly, terribly easy. And anyone can make it aged 8 to 88. Then the plums will go on top of the first layer, like that, and we'll just spread those out a little bit. And press them down a bit. And then the next lot goes on top. And I probably forgot to mention that it also works incredibly well with apples and in which case I would use a little bit of cloves in with the cinnamon. So now that gets spread on top. And then really now all you do is just make sure it's spread out quite evenly. But you don't have to be too particular about this. It's lovely. It's just, it just doesn't matter really how it, how it goes. But you've got to be very firm. Just press it down very, very firmly. And then the oven, you preheat to gas mark 6. And that's going to take 25 minutes. And I've got one here that has been baked and you leave it to cool for about 10 minutes and then take a knife and what I've done is I've just made some cuts to make it easier to, to, to break them up later on. Two vertical cuts lengthways and then four cuts widthways which will give you 15 altogether. But don't take them out now because um, it might be a bit crumbly. You need to leave it to get quite cold before you take them out. Anyway, that's one of my favourite recipes, that is plum and cinnamon oat slices. In Britain we have the finest apples in the world, so no fruit programme would be complete without an apple recipe. My apple and almond crumble uses both Bramley's and Cox's, although you can use other fruits as well. Add cinnamon and ground cloves and soft brown sugar to sliced apples then mix very thoroughly before putting them into a baking dish.
To make the crumble topping, add three ounces of chilled butter to six ounces of self-raising flour and four of demerara sugar with two teaspoons of cinnamon, then whiz them all in a processor till it resembles fine crumbs. Then add four ounces of unblanched almonds and process again, not too fast, until everything looks crumbly and the almonds are coarsely chopped. Now sprinkle the crumble mixture over the apples, press it down very firmly all over, then finish off by just running a fork over the surface. Bake in a hot oven for about 35 to 40 minutes, then leave it to rest for 10 to 15 minutes before serving either with pouring cream or a real homemade custard. This is my version of an American classic called Key Lime Pie. It's made with limes, condensed milk and egg yolks, and it's set on a crisp crust of digestive biscuits and grape nuts, served with creme fraiche and a twist of lime. This is a Christmassy recipe made with navel oranges which are spiced and cooked with port. It makes a lovely accompaniment to cold cuts, particularly ham. Well sadly my time's up again, but I shall be back next time with some information on and recipes for cheese. See you then. This is glorious cheese with a Welsh rabbit, Mexican enchiladas and a Greek cheesecake made with yoghurt, honey and pistachios. Well, how to cook with and how to eat cheese is my subject for today and cheese probably is one of the greatest gifts of all in food and something that we should have a real reverence for. Well, let me just pass on a little bit of my personal philosophy on cheese and that is I think there are two kinds of cheese one lot is for cooking and the rest is for just sitting down and eating. 
Now for cooking cheese, I think you need a good strong cheddar that you keep in your fridge and it's available all the time just for grating and making omelettes or having cheese on toast. I think you need a good Parmigiano Reggiano uh, in a piece that you can grate yourself every time you need it. That's also good for cooking. And I also think a good melting cheese <clears throat> is very important for cooking. One of the good melting cheeses is Gruyere or an Italian Fontina. But when it comes to eating cheese, the most wonderful thing about that is you don't actually have to cook at all. You can have a beautiful meal without any cooking. In fact, the French have a wonderful phrase they use about eating cheese, and they call cheese, wine and bread the trinity of the table, and I think that's absolutely right. It's lovely. Now, in France, it's very easy to buy good cheese, of course, because there are little cheese shops everywhere, and all the cheese always seems to be ripe and ready to eat, but they eat much more than we do, and we don't have that so often here. But I would urge you to actually find yourself a good cheese supplier. Taste the cheeses before you buy them, find out what they're like. And the really good news is that in this country there's been a real revolution in cheese making, not only in this country but also in Ireland, and we now have brilliant cheese makers, but the other good news is that you can actually buy some of these cheeses direct from the suppliers by mail and they will come in a box like this overnight, be delivered for about five pounds. Now, you won't have a big box like this, we're doing a television programme, they do come in smaller boxes and the nicest thing is you can actually store the cheese